1942, three death camps were built and staffed under top secret orders. These camps were all located in eastern Poland. But the most secret one was Sobibor. On October 14, 1943, the most successful escape happened in all of World War II. 300 of the 600 escaped. Prisoners had very little rights, if any, and when they arrived at Sobibor, the Jews that were considered useless to the SS officers were sent to the gas chambers and told that they were showers. The ones with special skill sets volunteered for specialized jobs within the camp. The main guy behind the plan was Alexander Pahersky. He was the chief organizer and the leader of the most successful uprising in the mass escape from the Jews. Alexander Pahersky was the son of a Jewish lawyer. He was born on February 22, 1909 in Ukraine. In 1915, his family moved to Rostov Una, where he eventually worked as an electrician in a locomotive repair company. Pekursky was a member of the Soviet Red Army with a rank of junior lieutenant. He was commonly known as Sasha. In October of 1941, during the Battle of Moscow, Pekursky's unit was surrounded and captured by the Germans in the pocket city of Yasma. On September 18, 1943, Pekursky, along with other Jews, were placed in a train cattle car which arrived at the Sobibor extermination camp. During his third day at Sobibor, he earned the respect of fellow prisoners by standing up to Karl Frenzel, an SS senior officer. After that episode, the Polish Jews approached Pekursky about ideas for an escape plan. His plan merged the idea of a mass escape. His goal was to help as many prisoners as possible to escape. Alexander Pekursky and many of his men made it back to Russia to rejoin the fight against the Nazis. In 1963, he gave a key testimony in a war of crimes trial held against 11 Ukrainian guards of Sobibor. Ten of them are sentenced to death. Later on in his life, he retired and now lives with his wife Olga in the Soviet Union. In the case of Sobibor, uh, you had an interesting combination of people in there. Uh, for one, first of all, you had a, a, a prison population. It was like its own society. They were a population in and of themselves. So if you're talking about rights and responsibilities, the prisoners had zero rights. Now, John Locke, who was a British philosopher, said that government, the purpose of government is to protect certain basic rights of individuals in society. Uh, when the government's not keeping its end of the bargain, John Locke says that people have a right to revolt to change that government. Going back to Sobibor, here you had a miniature society where the, the prisoners realized, first of all, that their rights were taken away. They didn't have any rights. They also realized that they were literally in their last leg of life. They would be put to death. They were not going to leave Sobibor. But then you had um, some characters come in, one Alexander Pahersky, who had experience in the Russian military. Uh, he wasn't afraid to use military action, aggressive, violent action, which a lot of prisoners thought they couldn't do uh, against the Nazis. But he was willing to do that. And so when they got together and realized, look, um, it, it's either them or us. We're all going to go to our death uh, unless we do something about it. So they decided to take things into their own hands, uh, let a revolt. Uh, it was successful. Many of them lost their lives, but many of them lived. And that's what was unique about uh, Sobor that we didn't see in a lot of the other concentration camps. One of the other organizers behind the revolt was Leon Feldhandler, a Polish Jewish resistance fighter. Prior to his deportation to Sobibor, Feldhandler had been head of the Jewish Council in his village in Poland. In the spring of 1943, Feldhandler led a small group of Sobibor prisoners in creating an escape plan. Their initial plan had been to poison camp guards and take their weapons, but the SS discovered the poison and shot five Jews in retaliation. Other plans, including setting the camp on fire and escaping during the chaos. But by the summer of 1943, these plans seem impractical. The arrival of Alexander Pahersky 
in late September gave new inspiration to the escape plans. Persky soon assumed leadership with Field Handler as his deputy. The group formed a plan that involved killing the camp's SS personnel and sending the Soviet prisoners of war to steal and then fight their way out of the camp's front gate. The uprising, which took place on October 14, 1943, was detected in its early stages after a guard discovered the body of an SS officer killed by the prisoners. However, about 320 Jews managed to make it outside of the camp. 80 were killed in the escape. 170 were soon recaptured and killed, as were all the remaining inhabitants of the camp who had chosen to stay. Some escapees joined the partisans. Of these, 90 died in combat or were killed by local collaborators or anti-Semites. 62 Jews from Soviet war survived the war, including 9 who had escaped earlier. Leon Feldhandler fought his way back to Lubland in Poland, where he remained safe until the liberation. There he ran a small business, employing and helping many Jews who had survived the camps, including Sobibor. Forty months after the escape, in a confrontation, he was murdered by his countrymen because he was a Jew. Still today, there are strong sentiments in Germany uh, toward people that are not Aryan that the white race and um, at that point in time uh, they felt like the Jewish people are controlling the economy controlling the financial war in Germany so there was a lot of uh, uh, resentment for the Jews there doing these things they also dressed differently they talked a a kind of bastardized German that is called Yiddish uh, that uh, they use. So they were different and this type of nationalistic feeling that they have, I think, caused them to try to eliminate. Stanislaus Meiser, better known as Slomo, was born March 13, 1927. He arrived at the Sobibor death camp when he was only 15 years old. After school, he went to work for a goldsmith, which came in handy when he was taken by the Nazis. In order to survive, he came forward voluntarily as a goldsmith, offering up his special skills to the camp. The gold he worked with came from the gas Jews, whose golden teeth and jewelry he had to melt down. In his capacity of welder and mechanic, he could move around the entire camp, which came in handy during the revolt. Shlomo had a very important responsibility during the retaliation. According to the plan for the uprising, prepared by Pekursky and Feldhandler, Shlomo had to attempt to steal rifles from the barracks of the Ukrainian guards. He was the ideal person for the job because his work allowed him almost unlimited freedom of movement in the camp and because he knew the layout of the barracks. Shlomo's assignment was crucial for the success of the uprising, because without guns there would be no uprising. It was risky. If he were caught in the act, the escape could not take place, because there would undoubtedly be large-scale retaliation. But he succeeded and aided greatly in the escape from Sobibor. After the war, Shlomo moved to Brazil, where he worked as a goldsmith. He later identified several SS officers and Nazis that were jailed for life. I think the key to that question is, uh, is education. Getting an education is more than just learning certain skills that you can use for uh, a job, to get a good job. Education is also to help us become good citizens. If we're good citizens, we pay attention to government, we understand what our rights are. We also know that we have responsibilities that go along with those rights so that we can maintain a free government and maintain freedoms and maintain those rights that we have. Uh, and, and we want to make sure that something like that that happened in, in Germany in the 1930s and, and 40s preceding World War II does not happen in this country. And I think that is, is, is a key uh, component of all of that.